All right, welcome folks. Happy Tuesday. Welcome. We are gonna spend a couple minutes waiting for folks to get here, but we have our panelists on the screen. Welcome in. I'm Sally Jenkins Stevens of the San Francisco Beacon Initiative, and we're super excited to host this webinar today. Welcome in. Hiring older adults in after school programs. That's where you are today. If you're in the wrong room, let us know. Um, <laughs> AJ, do we have any music? Or maybe play a song as folks are coming in. Or maybe not. All right. I hear a song in the background. Do that. All right, folks. Okay. A couple more minutes. Um, where are folks calling in from or zooming in from? Feel free to put it in the chat. Actually, feel free to just introduce introduce yourself in the chat. Can you do that on a webinar? Can you put something in the chat for everyone to see? Let's try it out. Can an attendee put something in the chat? Yeah. Okay. Well, Janice, you're a panelist. All right. Orange County. I'm in Berkeley, California, and it's gray and a little rainy. Ah. AJ, I just muted you on accident. All right, we're gonna get started. Um, welcome everyone. So this is a webinar I'm from the San Francisco Beacon Initiative. My name is Sally Jenkins Stevens, but this is co-hosted with Temescal Associates and How Kids, the How Kids Learn Foundation. So I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Jess, who's gonna kick us off. Hey everyone, um, thank you all so much for being here. We're really excited uh, to hear from this amazing panel and to sort of be in conversation with all of you. Uh, so we just want to give a couple sort of intro thoughts and words. And first of all, we just wanted to say a huge shout out to Sam Piha from Tamaskal Associates and the How Kids Learn Foundation. Sam's not on this webinar directly, but put in a ton of work behind the scenes to organize this whole thing. So thank you to Sam. Um, and a heads up that there will be a briefing paper from Temescal Associates coming out soon on this very topic. So keep an eye out and I'm sure you'll also get an email about it. Um, but before we start this conversation and hear from the panel, we just wanna take a couple of minutes to just say something that I'm sure is no surprise to anybody in the room here, but we know that um, in the field of after school, of out of school time and expanded learning, Hiring and retention has been a serious challenge for a long time. So understanding some of the nuances and finding creative solutions is something I know a lot of us are really interested in. And that's why this is such a wonderful opportunity to do a deep dive into one solution that's been utilized to address uh, the worker shortage in the field. And that is hiring of older adults or wisdom workers in after school programs. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Sally, who's going to introduce our panelists, and we're going to hear from all of them. And just a quick technical uh, issue, we are going to try to change the settings, but if you are in the audience and you have questions, 
uh, please try to send a direct message to me or Sally, and we will do our best at the end to make sure that as many of your questions and comments are shared and that the panel has an opportunity to, uh, to respond. All right. Thank you so much, Sally. Take it away. Thanks, Jess. I think I enabled the chat. Could someone from the, like an attendee, try to chat? Well, while we're working on that, actually, AJ, could you check that out as well while I introduce our panelists? Um, we are so excited to host this panel of super um, interesting leaders in the field who have done really innovative work around hiring older adults in after school and school day. So um, I'm going to kick us off and introduce our five panelists. So Eunice Lynn Nichols is the CEO of co-generate, the co-CEO. She spent more than two decades bringing older and younger generations together to bridge divides and solve problems, including leading the organization's innovative innovation portfolio, serving as a national campaign director for the Generation to Generation Initiative, running the Purpose Prize, now a program of AARP, and scaling experience scores from one neighborhood in San Francisco into a thriving Bay Area program, helping thousands of kids read by third grade. Eunice has been recognized as a Next Avenue influencer in aging and as a graduate of the Billions Institute Fellowship for Large Scale Change. She's also a recipient of the James Irvine Foundation Leadership Award for advancing innovative and effective solutions to California's most significant issues. Welcome, Janice. Feel free to wave to the people. <laughs> Hi, uh, our next panelist is Michael Funk. Michael Funk is currently the Director of Expanded Learning Division for the California Department of Education and was appointed in January 2012. He was charged with developing a strategic plan, building upon expanded learning to create programs that maximize outcomes for youth, families, schools, and communities. This work led to the Statement of Strategic Direction, identifying four key strategic initiatives. Michael brought together stakeholders from the EXLD field, which is the Expanded Learning Division, to finalize the plan and has continued to prioritize incorporating those principles of high quality learning into all aspects of the work of EXLD. Michael is leading the effort to support local education agencies across California to implement the new Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, or ELOP. Prior to this role, Michael was the founder and executive director of the Sunset Neighborhood Beacon Center in San Francisco, which provides engaging programs to youth and adults. Welcome, Michael. Uh, next, we have Deanne Morris, um, co-director of Generation Exchange Program and the Program Director of Community Outreach for the UCLA Clinical and Translation Science Institute's Community Engagement and Research Program in the Department of Medicine at UCLA. Her extensive involvement in community-based participatory research has led her to acquire the expertise to build strong partnerships in high-risk communities while creating innovative approaches to tackling health barriers and disparities. Her efforts in the field have led to successful funding of current and future projects relating to the issue of community engagement. Much of her work has focused on community outreach and coordinating community partnerships. She's collaborated with healthcare agencies, government authorities, and CBOs to support various efforts. As the co-director of intergenerational initiatives at UCLA divisions of geriatrics and internal medicine, she oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the LA Generation Exchange Program that seeks to improve academic and behavioral outcomes in children while concurrently enhancing the health for the growing population of older adults. Welcome, Deanne. Thanks for being here. Um, next, we have Janice Frechette Ardinger. She's the executive director of the Parentis Foundation in Orange County, California. Parentis Foundation is a proud program partner of AARP Foundation Experience Course, an intergenerational literacy intervention and support program, which she's going to tell us a lot about in a moment. Thanks, Janice. Welcome. And finally, we have Eric Gurna. Um, Eric is an experienced nonprofit executive and consultant committed to supporting the work of organizations dedicated to community and youth development and social justice. From 2015 to 2021, Eric served as president and CEO of LA's Best After School Enrichment Program, a partnership of the City of Los Angeles, the LA Unified School District, and the private sector, serving 25,000 children at nearly 200 Los Angeles elementary schools. Eric joined LA's Best as the second president and CEO in the organization's history. Eric brings a deep commitment to positive youth development to his work and a national reputation for thought leadership in the expanded learning movement. 
He also brings a nuanced understanding and appreciation for how children learn and develop and a passion for staff and program development. Welcome, Eric. What a packed room of cool, interesting people. So I'm going to pass it to Eunice to kick us off and really give us a foundation um, for what we're talking about today. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, there are a few spaces I'm more pleased to be in than this one today with this group of people. Um, I want to start off with a, a quick just personal journey that led me to a place where I'm so passionate about bringing older adults into the after school workforce. Um, I was a young person myself. I was 26 when I was first hired by another panelist here, Michael Funk, to run an intergenerational program called Experience Core, um, originally in the Sunset neighborhood of San Francisco, but it then grew into a citywide program and then a Bay Area wide program. And uh, this program, the whole goal of it was to bring older adults into public schools and the version of it that we ran in the Bay Area also into after school programs. Uh, so that we had these, these teams of older volunteers that were powering community action. And as a result, in my 20s, early 20s, I got to see magic happen every single day between my team of volunteers and the kids. Um, I kind of flash forward now uh, many years and I realized that while there was a lot of this magic that was happening relationally between our Experience Corps volunteers and the kids, there was something else that was happening at the exact same time. And that's that the mostly young staff that we had to work with, including myself, had a formative experience of working alongside the older generations and the mutuality of what we brought to one another brought a different level of scaffolding to turn schools that sometimes felt institutional into places that felt more like home. And so in those young years, um, I had a, a group of volunteers that profoundly shaped my view of what it looks like to dedicate the entirety of one's life to community change. Um, Michael will remember many of these people, but Diamond Dave Whitaker was a famed beat poet and mentor to Bob Dylan, and he spoke almost exclusively in rhyme. And he regularly would assure me, my staff and young people, uh, that I'd never be poor in mind if I had a library card. Uh, there was another volunteer, Virginia Sterwold, who was uh, a steely-eyed, somewhat intimidating uh, Filipino woman with this quaff of beautiful white hair. She was a survivor of the Bataan Death March in the Philippines, and then later a survivor of breast cancer. And she became like a, sec a second grandmother to me because my own grandmother lived far, far away. Um, and then there was Joe Friedman, who is one of the true greats from the greatest generation, who insisted when 9-11 happened. And I thought to cancel all of my volunteer trainings that day. And we had a phone tree back then. And I called Joe and he said, Eunice, this is exactly the time when we need to get together, not for volunteer training, but for connection. We need to mourn together. And then we need to gird up and go out and make a difference in the world. Um, these are the elders I was surrounded by when I was in my 20s. And my America Vista team and my colleagues at the Beacon Center had these elders in our lives. And they were not just mentors, but they were co-conspirators. Some became colleagues taking on paid jobs as volunteer recruiters, trainers, coordinators, and after-school instructors. Um, but they were also family. When I became pregnant with my first child, it was a team of experienced core members who threw me my first baby shower. Um, and I've just had the extraordinary privilege of watching teams like this, these multi-generational teams in education systems become um, the secret sauce for making incredible gains for young people, but also creating places that felt like home. So if I fast forward to today, it's been, I don't know, I think about 20 years since I first began this journey. Um, some things haven't changed. Uh, there's still an incredible workforce shortage of qualified caring staff in schools and after school programs. Um, I feel even more committed than ever that we need to shine a light on why older adults specifically can and should play a critical role in this work. Um, and the reason this is so important and timely today is there are two trends that I wanna make sure you all know about and focus on. It's almost like the biggest thing happening in our society that nobody is paying attention to. One trend is the fact that we are the most age diverse society in human history. In the 1900s, half of the population of our country was under 20 years old. It was just typical that you would have a ton of young people 
And then each subsequent generation, there would be fewer and fewer people. Uh, remarkably today, we actually have almost equal numbers of people of every age. There are literally the same number of seven-year-olds as there are 17-year-olds as there are 70-year-olds in the United States. Put another way, more than half the children born today will live to be 100 years old. Think about how our institutions are not structured for that. But also think about the opportunity to engage a much larger, older population that has a lot to give and frankly also will need to work and earn a paycheck longer, how we might engage them in the places where we have the greatest need. We have record numbers of older generations who are wired to serve and give back, much like my team of Experience Corps volunteers way back then. And we also have record numbers of young people who are socially conscious and activated. So they're like two halves of the same coin and represent a huge opportunity if they join forces to take action together. So I mentioned there are two trends that I wanted you to focus on. So the first is age diversity. Simultaneously, we are the most age segregated society we've ever been with shockingly few opportunities for generations to connect in daily life, much less it, to combine their talents and their skills for good. Um, anytime you have a, a, a certain aspect of diversity combined with segregation is a powder keg for conflict to happen. And some have predicted a future that's characterized by generational conflict, rampant ageism and misunderstanding. Um, to make matters worse, uh, if any of you follow the incredible work of our Surgeon General, he's raised the alarm bells on what he calls an epidemic of social isolation and loneliness that's impacting young people and older adults alike with health ramifications that he says are on par with smoking 15 cigarettes a day. But instead of being pulled apart by all these crises that we're experiencing, polarization in our country, we actually have a historic opportunity to tap the assets, the opportunity of um, five generations that could actually be in the workforce to solve some of today's biggest problems. Um, and there are studies that show that the workforce is better when we actually collaborate across generational divides. Um, there's a study from a number of years ago, uh, actually that came out of BMW where they tested three assembly lines. The one made up of just young workers was fast, but prone to errors. The one made up of older workers was accurate, but a little bit slow. And the, what we call co-generational line, the one that had older and younger generations together was fast and accurate. Uh, a little over a year ago, the nonprofit I work with, Co-Generate, uh, commissioned some new research because we kept hearing, we would say, older and younger need to come together to make change happen. And older and younger would say, yeah, but do people, do you know, each generation would say, does the other really want to do that? There was some skepticism. And so we said, let's just do some research and get the answer. And so we did a, a research with National Opinion Research Center at University of Chicago, surveyed 1,500 people ages 18 to 94, and um, asked them about their thoughts on this concept of cogeneration. We didn't know what would the results would be, but the survey uh, surprised us in a few ways. One, it showed that nearly everybody surveyed of every generation believes that cogeneration will actually make life better in our country that working together across generations can help us solve some of our most pesky problems and reduce divisions in society at the same time. Um, moreover, the, the research showed that olders and youngers have this deep pent up interest in working together specifically to solve those problems and that they really care about education, mental health and the environment. Um, perhaps the most surprising finding to us in the research was that while there's strong demand for cogeneration across the board, the strongest interest actually came from Gen Z, from the youngest people surveyed. It makes the possibility of working on a multi-generational uh, working on a multi-generational team an actual selling point for recruiting more young people into the after-school workforce. Um, young people are looking for network, for connection, um, both for mentoring and a chance to work uh, with a, a more diverse group of people. If we recruit older adults, including those from the neighborhood to be part of the team, that might actually be an additional incentive for young people to come to the table. Um, the last bit of research I wanna share with you is this past year, um, we had launched a new initiative called Generation Serving Together. It was actually an initiative to age integrate AmeriCorps. For those of you that use AmeriCorps members, you'll know, um, you know the majority of AmeriCorps members are young people. And then there's a division called AmeriCorps Seniors that is all older people. 
And we were launching some innovative work to try and bring these strands together. What if they worked together? What if you recruited an age diverse AmeriCorps team? Um, one organization, Ampact, um, they run reading and math core, joined our innovative cohort and they intentionally placed co-generational pairs of AmeriCorps members in schools and after school programs working side by side to help improve students' reading and math skills. They surveyed over 500 of their tutors at the end of the year and it revealed some big benefits for the quality of tutoring and for the prospect of bridging differences across generations. Uh, the respondents in that survey reported that they felt like working in a co-generational team actually made them a better tutor and it helped them to better be better at establishing strong relationships with their students. And the more time the tutors had with each other as a cross-generational team, um, those answers, the positive answers would bump up by 10%. So um, I will end with two things. One is to say that there is an opportunity here that's hidden in plain sight. And by that, I mean the elders in your communities surrounding your schools and your youth programs, your after-school programs, who if called, could be ready to join your teams, um, who may also desperately need a job, a part-time job, um, in order to make ends meet as we're living these longer lives. We can solve multiple problems, both the after-school workforce issue as well as the longevity issue. How will we live better quality lives as we live longer. We can do these two things at the same time. Um, and so uh, my, my big desire is to see youth serving organizations, including after school programs, feel a fire lit under them to build intentional quality co-generational teams um, and to do it in a way that harnesses the unique and diverse skills of olders and youngers working together uh, in a time when we're so focused on diversity, on equity and on inclusion I would say that if you have an intergenerational team, you'll have built in some incredible diversity that your team will better reflect the communities that you're based in. And that at the same time, you'll actually hit the biggest goal of creating belonging for all, not just for the students and the teachers, but for your, for your staff and ultimately for the community. Um, I'll end it there. I have a, a video that I wanna show you. It's just a, a short two minute clip um, on a project that Michael and I worked on, I think it was in our last like year or two at the Beacon Center before we moved on to uh, to our our next jobs. Um, and it was a program that was called Encore After School. And it was sort of a, at the time a scrappy project to prove that older adults could actually be recruited to become paid after school staff um, as coordinators, as after school directors, um, um, to run different programs. And we created a little video because people had such a hard time picturing an older adult doing engaging work in the chaos of the after school environment. Um, and so I'm going to try and play the video if I could share my screen for a second. Um, let me see if I can do that. And then I'm going to pass the mic over. So give me one second. I sold pharmaceuticals for 25 years. I took an early retirement and I wanted to do something that would allow me to use some of the competencies that I've developed and also give back to the city of Oakland. I grew up in Oakland. I just feel like I have an obligation to the city where I got my start. I think Mr. Hall's experience working years of working and um, professionalism is rubbing off on everyone and above and beyond what I thought Mr. Hall could do with them. He, he did. I mean, these kids are challenging themselves. These kids have, are showing mass amounts of improvement. Mr. Hall made it cool to learn. Not only is Mr. Hall connecting with kids and helping them enjoy learning things like math, but he's also providing them with great activities and music and appreciating and enjoying ways of listening to music that a lot of these students haven't experienced before. I think you find our Encore members are connecting with kids like this in most of our programs. One of our guys um, actually wrote a song for one of the school sites, and they sing it every time that they meet. It's a beautiful song. It's about the school. It brings energy into the whole program, and it energizes the staff, and it makes people happy. It's all for my group, it was a musical storytelling group, I put, well, put together a little song that they can sing 
and that, you know, as they learn the words, okay, they can uh, learn what this pride is about. So we're thinking about pride and touch the sky. We're in East Oakland and we're setting our, our goals high. Pride I'm Cherry Brock, and um, I am teaching dance and drama. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to pass the mic on to my next colleague. Thank you, Eunice. Um, our next presenter is Michael Funk. Hi, everyone. Eunice, bringing, bringing back the memories of uh, all those people and those names. Uh, with all due respect to everyone I've ever hired, I say unequivocally, <clears throat> Eunice has been the best hire of my life. Um, she knocked Experience Corps out of the park. There was 1997 a group called Civic Ventures, which was on Corps, and Mr. Mark Friedman, who borrowed the name Experience Corps from John Gardner, um, started talking to us. Well, you've got a lot of young people in the Sunset District. You've got a lot of older people. Uh, I was 38 at the time. And uh, we'd like you to be a program site. And long story short, after many, many months, they nothing was moving. They had a hard time finding an agency to be the lead. And I said, can we can we just run the thing for the Bay Area? It started in the sunset. And uh, <clears throat> after a short startup, uh, we wanted to hire a full-time person to lead it. And Eunice at age 26, I can't believe it. Eunice, we were younger then, but we launched into this thing. And you mentioned all these names. I want to just bring you back, Eunice. Imagine me with dreadlocks right now. Everyone got that in your mind? Cast a wide net. Find the common thread. Let Life, flourish. Diamond Dave Whitaker <laughs> would say that all the time. And we just had all these characters. And, you know, as a 39-year-old, I kept thinking about these old people, these old people. And then by the time I left that neighborhood almost 17 years later, I was would be in these meetings and they'd ask me where I was volunteering because I was the same age. <laughs> But you know, um, Eunice, you've 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 gone. I just want to say you've gone on and you've you've created ripples across the world in your leadership for this intergenerational work, and I'm very proud of you. Proud to have been uh, a catalyst for this path for you. And now in this situation in California. You know, back then, state-funded, federally-funded after-school programs was getting traction, getting momentum. Uh, when I went to the department, State Department of Ed in 2012, I oversaw roughly $750 million, which was a lot of money. And today, it's $5 billion. And we are challenged to find the workforce. And ever since... I mean, those years in San Francisco <clears throat> instilled in me not only the idea of a, a practice of creating intergenerational environments, but a value. It's something I believe in. It's something I believe we all should believe in. And to bring that to uh the workforce in California in expanded learning or after school summer programs has been a passion of mine. Those individuals on that film, I just remember recruiting them and did with working with David Brick and and who, who made the film and Eunice. And we had this 
little workforce grant from the Packard Foundation that funded several projects. And Eunice and I were just like looking at our Experience Corps volunteers and looking at, they were at it for five, six, seven years. You just couldn't get rid of them. They were, they were just became part of the fabric of these schools. And the principals and the staff at these schools would talk about how these teams of older adults changed the culture. They deepened the culture. And it's clear that some of these people have the talent, skill, the ability. They should be full-time after-school staff if they want to be. And so we made a pitch to Packard to uh, start this thing called Encore After School. And I remember recruiting <clears throat> several agencies uh, to agree to be part of this pilot. And at that time, the agency that the Sunset Neighborhood Beacon and Experience Corps was part of was also launching after school programs in Oakland after the passage of Prop 49. But you know, I, I found that as many times as people like the idea of hiring older adults, very few of the agencies actually hired an older adult, even though we took these Experience Corps members and put them in the pipeline and they got set up for interviews. And I remember having so many conversations where they'd come back deflated because, hey, I, I thought I interviewed really well, but they wouldn't hire me. And most of the Encore After School <clears throat> folks, all of them in that film were, were working at sites that we ran, that we actually had control of. And while we currently have the a lot of our line staff and after school programs stay two or three years. These folks stayed four, five, six years as well because they weren't looking to go on to the next thing. This was their this was their purpose in this chapter of their life. So uh, I've been pitching this idea in California. Uh, let's figure out a way to be more intentional about diversifying the workforce. Not because we just want to fill slots, but I believe diversified, as Eunice already said with that BMW study, that's great, Eunice. Diversifying the workforce is a critical strategy to increase the quality of what our children experience. It's the intergenerational workforce as a strategy towards higher quality. And <clears throat> to do that, we have to be intentional in how we think about the workforce. We have to be intentional about how we advertise. What kind of images, what kind of messages do you put on your advertisements? Where do you advertise? It predominantly, expanded learning programs advertise in college campuses, and uh, which is great. But what about going to the Rotary, the Lions Club, you know, faith-based houses of worship? Um, Houses of worship, especially. This is where many of those in attendance are already wired in their heart towards service and wanting to give back and looking for more opportunities. So how do we advertise? What kind of images do we use uh, in our advertisements? Um, one thing I learned with Encore After School, <clears throat> who's on your hiring panel? You know, if you've got a bunch of 30-year-olds on the hiring panel, they're not likely to see the value. So diversify the age of your hiring panel. Let's be intentional about, we're so intentional about diversity, equity, inclusion when it comes to uh, sexual orientation, identity, ethnicity, uh, all those types of things. And yet, Rarely are we so intentional about age diversity and equity. You know, some of the things you sent out before the workshop even referenced some of that from the Harvard Business, I think, review we talked about being intentional. Um, I just feel like um, one, of the, one of the things that kept coming up is when people felt 
in a quiet moment, some of some of our hiring managers, do you think those people can really keep up with the kids? Do you think they can really handle a group of 20 elementary school kids? And I tried to respond politely. What makes you think a 21 year old can handle a group of 20 elementary school kids? You get some someone who's actually been a parent, someone who's got experience. Uh, and then of course, with our idea of energy and can people keep up? Uh, well, I'm now 63, so I'm one of those. And I can keep up with any group of 20 kids any day. So I'm grateful for this opportunity, Sam and Temescal and team and Sally for hosting us and Eunice, thanks for kicking us off and I hope to have some great conversation with our other panelists. Thank you, Michael. You know, as, um, as we move throughout this morning, we're gonna sort of record some tips for programs that we can share. So I just wanna note a couple tips Michael shared around using the same strategies we know for diversity, equity, inclusion, and hiring for race and, and gender and sexual orientation, using that for um, intergenerational diversity. I love that. Um, thank you. I'm gonna pass it on to Deanne. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here to share about um, some of the work I'm doing here in Los Angeles, California, and the South LA area. And um, I have a um, intergenerational program called Generation Exchange. And actually, um, I, I'm talking to Michael and Eunice this morning, um, I realized that I got the idea from Experience Corps AARP. I was approached um, about 20, 2012, I believe, from a Dr. Teresa Seaman. Um, she used to do uh, research in um, in Baltimore on the Experiment Corps. So she came to me and asked me, would I be interested in doing something like that? At the time, I was working with the Los Angeles Urban League, um, working in as their health director. So they sent me, UCLA sent me to Baltimore to spend some time in some of the schools that were doing experiment core. So I got a chance to meet with the principals and the volunteers and um, sit in the classrooms with the students just to kind of you know, get a feel of the program. And this is a program that um, in Baltimore, they do K through third grade, I believe. And um, it was a in, during the day program. So you're in the classroom actually during the day. So I came back to LA and I said, okay, I went to Baltimore. I'm excited. We need to do this. So um, we got some seat money from a private funder, um, started in one school with five volunteers. I now have seven schools and we have 65 volunteers, 65 plus volunteers and I'm in South LA and opening up a new school in the East LA area. Esperanza Elementary in um, February, so um, which will be another 10 volunteers. So um, we've come a long ways. Um, of course, we had some challenges. One of the things that I realized that when I came back, before I even went, I, I told, um, I used to run a, a, a health consortium um, in LA. And so a lot of the, the, the committee was made up of um, Department of Health Department of Mental Health, DPSS, and all these different health departments and clinics. But there was community members. I always make sure that I have community on board when I'm doing anything. So the community members were saying, oh, I think that's a great idea. We need to do it. Sign me up. I don't care when it is. Just let me know. So I had one volunteer every month, every time we met. She said, so when are you going to start this program? You know, of course, it takes a while because we have to find money. Um, so and this is a, one of the volunteers with me that has been with me since day one. Um, so what we did, we took, uh, we looked at volunteers. We recruit volunteers 50 years and over, and we put them in the classrooms K through five. We started with K through three. Um, last year, the year before last, we started a pilot to go to fifth grade. Principals and teachers and the students were like, you know, I want my volunteer to go to my next grade. You know, I want them to go to the fourth grade. I want them to go to the fifth grade with me, you know. So we decided to um, add 
uh, we started going up to fifth grade and it has been very successful. And but one of the things that we learned that a lot of the volunteers, um, people that are passionate, I think somebody mentioned like folks that are natural volunteers will volunteer, you know, they're passionate about what they do in the community. So that means they volunteer. They might have five volunteer jobs, um, but they're always willing to add one more job. And so when I would approach people in the community through community organizations, word of mouth, through churches, other CBOs, I talked about one of the things about giving time, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, however, we do pay a $200 stipend and I tell people it's a stipend. It's not a salary, so don't you know think you're going to pay your cable bill or anything off of that two hundred dollars. It's a thank you. We appreciate saying that we appreciate your time uh, working with the students in the classroom. So our volunteers and we also, before anyone goes in the classroom, they have to go through a one week training, eight hours a day, um, for five days, sometimes six days. And we actually talk to them and train them about what's going to happen in the classroom. Because some people are a little nervous um, if they don't have kids or um, they're like, oh, I've never worked with kids. Or I don't have any or my grandkids are grown. And, you know, and the, one of the things that we talk about in training is that this is a new breed of kids. It's not like how you raise yours, probably. It's not how your grandparents raised you. So we have to meet the kids where we are. The students that I work with in South LA, 40% of them are in foster care group homes. So one of the things that they have always been subjected to is being um, dismissed, de denied dysfunctional households. So what we try to do is make sure our volunteers understand that this is a commitment that they have to do for the full year. And when they commit is that, the students are used to always somebody disappointing them. And one of the things about students, all of you that work with students, the first thing you have to do is gain the trust of that student. And once you get the trust of the student, um, it's, it's just like a miracle. It's like you become the new best friend. So you're not the teacher, the grandmother, the auntie, the sibling, telling them what to do or asking them to do something or trying to help them. You're kind of, you become the new best friend. So our volunteers, develop relationships with these students. And that's why, you know, you can see a volunteer walking across the campus and kids are hollering their name because they remember them from kindergarten or from for pre-K or from first grade. It's like, where are you being? You know, I miss you. I want you to come back to my classroom, you know. So it's really a relationship building. Um, one of the things that we work with is um, reading and math proficiency. Um, one of the things that... I, why I really love the program. I was doing a lot of work in some of the schools. And every time I go to schools, I go to the principal's office and there's a group of boys, at least 12 or 13, in the principal's office lined around the floor, sitting, squatting. And I'm like, so why do we have the kids? Oh, well, they were sent from the teacher because they were acting up or, you know, they had bad behavior. And we know that if our kids go to principal's office so many times because for behavior, the next thing you know, they're going to put them in special ed without even figuring out why they're in special ed. And what I realized is that these students aren't bad, but they cannot read. For example, you have a student that I call little Johnny that's in the classroom and he's acting up, rolling on the floor, you know, teachers trying to do a, a reading circle Little Johnny's acting up, but he knows that the teacher is not going to call his name because he's acting up. So you got to be still, be quiet for you to get called on. So um, we, as a volunteer, I would take that that student to the back and say, so what's going on? And then you realize, he says, I can't read and I don't want to be bullied. I don't want people to make fun of me. So that's why that behavior comes because they don't want to be bullied. And we know bullying is a real issue in the, in the, in the schools. So our goal has always been to work with that student, little Johnny, to um, get him back so he can get in that reading circle, so he can raise his hand and he'd be able to read. So one of the things that our volunteers, we train them about things that happen in the classroom. We bring folks from LA Unified to actually um, talk about social justice, mental health, all the things that we know that affect. Now, a lot of that we know that is on the job training. So once you get in the classroom, it's going to be a little different. 
Um, but we try to give them the tools and the toolkit for them to go into the classroom and feel comfortable. Um, our volunteers are required to um, work a minimum of 10 hours a week. And we realize because that works, we know that if you spend 10 hours a week with a student, um, you're able to um, make a difference in their life. So in its consistency. So if you work Tuesday, Thursday, five hours a day. So our volunteers are given the opportunity to pick the hours that they want in the days based on what the teacher's need is. So they will pick their um, grade levels that they're comfortable. Some people like the little kids. Um, some people prefer older students. Um, our males always prefer the um, third, fourth, fifth graders. Um, because they don't do the, you know, the fuzzy, fuzzy kind of thing, especially if they don't have kids at home or, or grandkids. Um, we realize that 50 years and over, people that are retired and not looking for a job, a lot of the people that I recruited in the beginning were folks that were uh, retired. And I call it where people, when they work every day, they have work friends. But when they retire, they don't have those friends anymore. They don't have the relationships that they had built where they do the weddings and the weekends and the baby showers and stuff like that. So they missed that because that was what they did when they were working. So, but in Generation Exchange, our volunteers have developed relationships, you know, where they go to gyms together, they walk together, um, they have work with their families. A lot of them, their kids don't live in the state anymore. So they're someplace else, so they're lonely. So we had volunteers who say they never got out the bed before 12 noon because they didn't have anything to do. So now they have something to do. We also try to recruit volunteers around the schools that we're at so that our volunteers can walk um, to the campus. So that gives them exercise. So not only are the kids um, getting a benefit from the program, but so do the adults. Because I think it's important that our adults, um, we look at their social behavior, their cognitive skills, um, just keeping them active. Um, we had folks that couldn't walk up a step. Every step they had to stop and, and breathe, you know. Um, now they run up and down the steps, you know, without a cane. Before they were using a cane to get up and down the steps. So you see so many benefits just from our adults that make them feel like they're wanted, they're needed. Um, the little folks, you know, are standing at the door waiting for them to come in every day because it's like, well, where you been? Why are you late? Now they can't tell the time on the clock, but they know if you're supposed to be at 830, that they know when 830 is. So they will be looking for you and want to know why you're not there. Um, and one of the things that I think um, both um, Eunice and, and Michael talked about is that um, generation intergenerational programs is, is really a win-win um, because the, the young people, um, the little people, they learn from the adults and also the adults learn from the little folks. You know, when their phones aren't working or they can't get on face, to, they give the phone to one of those kids and they will tell them what to do and how to do it. One of the things that we did um, during the pandemic, because we have always been in classroom and our volunteers really like being um, in the classroom with the kids versus on Zoom. But we had to um, take 60 folks and take them from being in classroom to being um, virtual. And that was a challenge, but we got through it. But, you know, we had volunteers that had flip phones that didn't even do Zoom. So, we you know, we had to encourage them to get new phones, but we did provide them with um, laptops and hotspots. And, and, you know, it was the 24-7 training that we did with them. Um, during the COVID, we even did a outside training where we had um, folks come to one of our churches and we set up tents on a parking lot outside and people brought their laptops and we were able to do one-on-one -on -one training with them to get them to be able to use a laptop. They never did that. But what came out of the, the good thing that not only did were they able to work with the kids during the whole pandemic, but they developed relationships with their families. So now these folks are having family reunions, birthday parties online, things that they never thought they could do. And because they couldn't travel, they were still able to communicate with their families. So it really has been a blessing all around, not only for the kids, but for the, the volunteers. But one of the things that, you know, our volunteers have put in over like 25,000 hours over the years that we've been doing the project. Um, and it's because they have a passion 
And we look for folks who have a passion for giving back that are, are willing to, um, you know, to, to work with students. So I think that's pretty much all for right now, but I could um, add some other things later on. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Deanne. I love highlighting the benefit, you know, not just for kids and the staff at current programs and schools, but to the older adults themselves. And we know that if everyone in our community is healthy, our kids are more likely to be healthy and our, our schools will be stronger. So that like joint strengthening is incredible. Um, thank you, Deanne. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to pass it to Janice. Wow. Well, I feel like the next generation because I, um, first of all, I'm honored to be on this panel today and did not realize when I was asked that, um, Michael Funk, you, you really are the godfather of Experience Corps. This is pretty exciting. Um, Eunice and Deanne, I am part of AARP Foundation Experience Corps here in South Orange County. And as um, the executive director of Parentis Foundation, uh, 2016, I worked for a Parentis Health agency that supported older adults through home care, home health, hospice, residential boarding cares. And the owner of, of the Parentis Health um, um, enterprise of older adult support really wanted to start a volunteer program or an, a nonprofit that supported older adults in the community. But we also knew that youth education was so important. So that marrying and that magic, as Eunice said, and I use this all the time when I'm talking to others, it's that magic of intergenerational connection, that, that mentoring experience that you get when you um, put a child together with an older adult and that wisdom that they, an unconditional attention that they give to the children. Not to mention that what we gain from working with our older adult volunteers. So 2016, we met with AARP Foundation. They came out here. They were looking to expand in Orange County. They had already partnered with LA's Best in LA, and they had another um, chapter of Experience Corps in San Diego. And of course, they had the Bay Area. And um, so about there were about seven Experience Corps programs throughout California. And we realized that we wanted to take on Experience Corps as our foundation's platform, as our as our flagship program. So fast forward now, we have um, almost 180 volunteers that both support full-time one-on-one -on -one support with the kids, as well as substitutes. We have 11 schools and after-school programs that we partner with. And we provide approximately a little over 600 one-to-one -one tutor sessions a week with a very small core of staff and Parentis Foundation. So we have the amazing opportunity to work with our AmeriCorps Vistas. And Eunice, when you talked about your AmeriCorps Vistas, um, I have Vistas who are retired. And I have Vistas who have just graduated college and who are going through college. So we have a true intergenerational program from first graders to retirees. And I get to sit somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I'm over 50 now. So I actually qualify for the AARP volunteer program. But that, that intergener intergenerational connection on all levels of our programming has been so powerful for our program partners. And so all of you that are listening right now, and the goal for, for you is to think about how do I incorporate older adults in my staff? How do we incorporate them as volunteers or staff in an after-school program? It's really a unique opportunity that everybody should get excited about and not fearful about. One of the things that we've learned in partnering with Boys and Girls Clubs we started partnering with our Boys and Girls Clubs in Orange County. We're now in seven branches of various Boys and Girls Clubs, as well as Title I schools in person. Um, and we also serve virtually still after the pandemic. We had an entire core of volunteers who really enjoy tutoring via Zoom. And Deanne, we were right there with you. I mean, I, I figured out how to get a 
a Zoom contact person in Florida, if I woke up at four in the morning and I could call them at seven to get a contact person. So I worked a lot of 4 a.m. mornings to get us on Zoom. And now we do a combination of both hybrid and virtual tutoring, depending on what our partners need, our program partners. So I want to take a moment and really, I'm going to share a very quick slide deck with you all. And I think I have share rights here. Um, and sh to show you what it looks like to be a an experience core program here in Orange County. Can I get a thumbs up if everybody can see my screen? Awesome. And we truly are transcending generations through volunteer connection. And I have to tell you, we've been around for seven years. Some of my volunteers have now joined my board of directors. There is truly wisdom you need to tap into in this volunteer corps that around all parts of the country. Since 2017, Parentis Foundation Experience Corps has, has completed more than, served more than 1,100 students. Primarily, we started first through third grade, but as a result of the pandemic, and the loss of learning that some of our fourth and fifth graders that are currently now fourth and fifth graders are so severely behind in their reading skills, we realized that we also needed to serve our fourth and fifth grade children. And they were already behind prior to 2020. Well, now we are so proud that we're actually getting them to a proficient third grade reading level, which is really where they need to start succeeding academically. We seek to address the needs of children who are proficiently behind third grade reading level, and we want to get them to be proficient readers. We want to combat the onset of poverty. In education, we realize that so much of the challenge that kids are experiencing right now is generational poverty. And we want to be able to empower them to become strong, confident, leaders in their classrooms, in their communities, and really help them to overcome their fear of what they're not good at. Like Deanna said, that one little boy was in the principal's room because he couldn't read. That's real, but they're not gonna show that vulnerability in the classroom. The way they show it is by acting out. So are, we train our older adults to witness, to, to learn how to, support these children unconditionally. And through building their confidence, we're helping the classroom teachers. That's where this connection of building the wisdom of our older generation volunteers and putting them and employing them within the schools and after school programs with appropriate support for the volunteers, because we have to make sure they understand the culture of the, the program we're placing them at. The children thrive. When the children thrive, so do the teachers, so do the staff, so do the social workers in the school. And you know what? The parents. The parents are so grateful that we are here bringing them a mentor, bringing them a grandparent figure to support them when truthfully, when they get home, let's face it. If you've ever had children and you're told that they have to read 20 minutes as part of their homework assignment, how many of you as parents have just given them the book, you're starting to cook dinner and you hope the heck they read? They probably didn't. They So when they're one-on-one -on -one with their mentors, and of course our focus is literacy support, they are gaining that win-win for not only themselves, but for the community and their schools and their home life. We're giving them an opportunity to succeed when you pair older adults with children. But I also know that you're probably thinking, well, how does that work with my staff? How do I get them to understand? Like Mike, Michael, you said, it sounds like a great idea until this generation, uh, the staff in core, say in a boys and girls club or an after school youth program, they don't even know how to connect at an, with older adults properly. How do older adults learn? How do we train them to interact with kids when it's 
organized chaos when there's 400 kids moving around the building? How do we show them intentional opportunities to engage? I want you to hear how some of our volunteers have engaged with the kids and how it's impacted them. It's one of those things which are hard to describe, but if you've worked with children before, you'll understand that the reward is something very different. Somehow you touch these people's lives and you really make a difference. Working with the kids and it helps you remember growing up and what kind of struggles you went through learning to read. It, you know, opening up their world for them kids just gives you a, just a real pleasure. The children come in, um, I would say flatline. And when I see them at the end of the year, it's like a balloon going up. They have such joy in reading, which is what I want to impart to them, the joy of reading. It's very rewarding starting with them and watching them grappling to get onto the ladder. And it's very fine to look at the end of the year and see how they are now making progress. Just watching the kids open up and um, go from very, you know, a shaky grasp of reading to being able to read with fluency and, and enjoy themselves. One of my most rewarding uh, experiences was with a little boy. And all he would do was tell me, Miss Janet, I can't do this. This is too hard. I was his tutor for, I think, three or four years. And it made me so proud because at the end of my time with him, he was so proud of what he could do. And many of these children may never travel anywhere. One little boy I had never went to the zoo, but I told him he, we could study all kinds of animals through books. Reading is what made my, you know, made me successful. Reading is what, you know, opened up entire worlds for me. But I think one of the most important things is to be able to see what the world looks like through a child's eyes. And often, even as we get older, our eyes become a little bit jaded. The world is very different when you watch it through a child's eyes. The world is very different when you watch it through a child's eyes. Isn't that true? In, and teachers have really embraced the connections that we bring when we have our volunteers come into the classroom or they log them all on on Zoom. Did you see those two little kids? They're holding hands. They each were on a Zoom call with their mentors and they were supporting each other by holding hands in the background. And that was, to me, that was priceless. They weren't fearful. They weren't angry. They weren't frustrated. They were relaxed. That's something that our volunteers give the kids is an opportunity to have a safe space to just breathe, to not feel like they have to, to constantly fight up that, that ladder and worry about being bullied and worry about not being good at something or having to wait their turn in a large classroom where they're waiting for their next person, where most of the time they're going to go off and do something to get out of what they do, they know they're not good at. So when you're looking at hiring an older adult, there's really something that is that synergy, that simultaneous connection of responsibility, knowledge, respect, and care. And you not only see that between the staff and the, and the volunteers or the, the older adult employees, but you see that the kids begin to start learning those core values. When you're looking at designing a program to incorporate an older adult workforce. Um, I sit on a, a committee with through 1OC and um, with um, the Santa Ana Chamber of Commerce president for 55 and older workforce development. And I also, I bring to them and I talk to them about, it, it's not just saying that older adults come with the wisdom, they do. But what's as important is understanding their learning styles, understanding how you onboard an older adult volunteer who's got years of experience, but may not have any experience in today's workforce world. It, that's such a completely different um, mindset. 
So how you're going to onboard a 22-year-old out of college may be very different than how you onboard an older adult who may have been retired for 10 years and is just feeling as vulnerable as the 22-year-old, but has other things to bring to the table. So one of the things we do through our program here at Experience Corps Orange County is we have a weekly coffee chat with our volunteers. They log on every Wednesday at 9 a.m. And out of our 160 plus volunteers, we have an average of 60 that show up every single Wednesday morning. That's pretty impressive. No companies usually get that kind of return for employee attention. So every single week, we offer our volunteers a different learning opportunity. We will bring clips of tutor sessions to the table. Let's talk about the highs and lows of last week. What did you experience? Are the kids coming to you on time? Is there transition issues? Is the child coming in tired? Are they complaining that they're hungry? Did something get revealed that you need to know how to manage and handle? Older adults internalize the, these lives of children. They take it very seriously and very personally. So they, we have to train them how to unpack that information and where do they go with that information once they get it from the kids? Because now they're a mentor to these children and you ask a child a question and they will be, they'll, they'll be diarrhea of the mouth if, for lack of a better word to say. And then, so we have to train them how to manage this information. So that's one of the things that we're really proud of in doing here is making sure that we recognize the value of our volunteers but we also recognize their vulnerabilities and how that we make sure that we can train them to provide over 11,000 tutor sessions in a school year and ask them, what more do they want to do? If you don't ask somebody, they can't say yes. Do they want to do more? Do they want to join my board? Do they want to be on an advisory team? We started a program called One Kind Word and it's all run by our volunteers. They research all the things that are happening for the month in the, in the community. Um, is it anti-bullying month? We look for, for quality books to share with the kids. We, we look to talk about how do we train our program staff around these curriculums to help empower the volunteers, but engage the kids. So one of the things that you think about when you're bringing on older adults is they may not just be tutors. There's lots of tutors. There's lots of tutoring programs. There's a lot of mentoring programs, but how do you make them feel empowered to be both? And that's where, if you're a school thinking about hiring or an after-school program thinking about hiring older adults, always think about adding that component. How do we make sure we empower them to be the best they can be? Because their experiences may not have come to this point but they have the time and the talent to help, but they need support. You can't just throw them in and think that they're going to be able to manage a, a, a games room full of 60 kids that are running around and it's like hurting butterflies. We know it's fabulous work. We know it's organized chaos, but an older adult needs a little more structure usually and a little more direction so they feel confident in how they're working with the kids. So imagine the trainings. These were some of our trainings when we were in person. And we do, the, we do these four times a year. We have our coffee chat opportunities. We bring on guest speakers. We talk about what do volunteers need and how can we make them more impactful when we put them into the schools and after school programs. The wisdom is truly in, the, in, in their time with the kids and their time with the staff and our program partners and how we can connect them. So, and I feel like the next generation of Experience Corps because I'm sitting here with all the legends that have started Experience Corps. We've barely scratched the surface of the amount of kids we can serve in the amount of older adults that are out there if you just ask for their time. Um, thank you for this time and thank you for this opportunity.
Thank you, Janice. Um, so much good information about the how and training and onboarding um, necessary. And I would argue some of those young people need a lot more structure also for managing 60 kids in a game room. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm going to pass it to our final panelist, Eric Gurna. And after that, we'll have a conversation with everyone together. Great, thank you. Um, it was great to hear from everybody. Thank you so much. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I want to start off, I want to bring a specific perspective because I feel like for those in attendance today, you've gotten a lot of information about why this is so critical and important. Um, and you've gotten a lot of examples and inspiration for you know how this can be great. Um, but I want to bring a specific sort of operational perspective of some concerns and challenges about taking this to scale. Um, because I really think that that to me is the critical issue. It, we, we have, there's a lot of pilot projects, not just for this, but for a lot of different things. Um, but to really make a difference at the level of scale that, that Michael was just talking about in the state of California alone, um, I think we have to take a little bit of a different perspective. Um, to give a little bit of background and just give my cred on this, when I was uh, president CEO of LA's Best, um, serving over 20,000 children and close to 200 schools. We did have a multi-year partnership with AARP Experience Corps, as, as Janice had mentioned. We started around the same time um, as Orange County, I guess maybe a little bit before, but, um, and that was an amazing partnership. We had, you know, several children who got to benefit from that at a, at a few schools um, and a cohort of really dedicated, amazing, volunteers. Um, and it was a lot of work. Partnerships are a lot of work. And especially when you're working at the scale of the school district, because not to get into the whole, what is LA's best, but LA's best is a, is a partnership of the city, the school district and the private sector. So it's actually part of Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, and, you know, LA's best alone serves over 20,000 students, but, you know, there's many other quality after school programs and the district itself serves tens of thousands more every day. Um, and, and, you know, so when you're dealing with a monolith of an institution like a school district and truly much smaller school districts are in many ways just as challenging to deal with institutionally, um, a part, an institutional partnership requires a lot of finesse. It requires a lot of figuring out how we can meet the needs of, you know, ARP experience cores evaluation and research, but also work around some, you know, um, constraints that we might have, given that we're a district program or given that we have limited capacity. So as such, you know, we had a significant grant and had a, um, a half time person solely focused on that program. And that was a real luxury we, because it was only at three or four schools you know, it's serving several dozen kids, but we have a dedicated staff person to managing that. And, you know, also to recruiting the volunteers and all of that. But it also required a lot of, um, my time as CEO would require the director of evaluation, it required the director of staff development. Many after school programs don't have those positions because they're not at the level of scale that they don't have the internal capacity. So trying to take a partnership like that to scale as wonderful as it may have been, um, is not at all realistic. And it's a, when you break down the price per student, it's astronomical relative to the price of care. And the volunteers are not counting in ratio, right? So we still have to have a staff person. We still have to be paying a staff person to be in that room. So as much value as we get out of the interaction and as much of the literacy support as those um, younger, you know, we had like kindergarten through through third graders. Um, it's it's not really sustainable at, at that level of scale. Um, so, you know, the, the webinar is called hiring older adults. And I, I want to highlight that we're conflating some of this as we as we use examples, and they're really not the same thing. Um, volunteers are um, not free. They're a significant amount of work and usually put in far less hours and don't count in ratio. So I'm not knocking vo volunteers, but I think that this issue of hiring older adults, as Michael talked about, um, requires a different approach. Um, so 
I, I want to sort of focus on that because I think that the, the highlight when we really focus on hiring is that I think this has been alluded to at the beginning. I think what we have here is what I like to think of as a chocolate peanut butter situation. These are two things that go really well together. We have this massive staffing shortage in after school, and we've got this huge population of, of, of qualified you know, individuals who are not really being tapped into for this. And I completely agree, Michael, it's not just about operationally meeting, you know, putting, you know, butts in seats, as we say, you know, getting a warm body in the room. It's about improving the quality of the program. So I'm going to take for granted that everybody has already accepted that the intergenerational work is has tremendous value in meeting outside of just the fact that we have a staffing shortage. And I'm not going to repeat Eunice and the others and going into why all that's important. Um, but to just focus on, you know, what, what Michael, you were starting to talk about, like, how do we advertise? Um, how do we do outreach? I know, you know, I can't speak for LA's Best currently, but um, for, for many, many years at LA's Best, a lot of our outreach for recruitment was in, was at local colleges. You know, a, a majority of our workforce is college or college students or college age, quote unquote, traditional college age. Um, and so it would stand to reason that those are the job fairs, those are the job boards, those are the in-person recruitments, all that stuff. Um, but my question is like, where does Walmart focus on hiring when they hire older adults? Um, where, you know, if we can look at what other industries are doing to who are, who have a significant percentage of older adults in their workforce and, and try to, you know, do some of those things. Um, another thing I think that really needs to be focused on, and I actually think this is crucial to focus on to, for solving the whole staffing shortage, um, but particularly for, for hiring older adults, is to see if we can change our mentality about what the commitment is of the job. Because a lot of people aren't ready to commit 20 hours a week, you know, four hours a day, five, five days a week. And if we, and I know some programs do this already, um, if we can be more flexible, as Deanne had noted, um, you know, maybe it's a 10 hour a week job, or maybe it's a one day a week job, like maybe there's a lot of different ways to fit to, to make this work, um, to meet the needs of both the programs and um, these potential employees. Um, I do want to point out one thing that was said earlier that I think is like a red flag and hugely critical that maybe we could focus on in the conversation if we have time. Um, Michael, you mentioned that when you would provide this pipeline and give all this encouragement and set up these folks to be interviewed, that a lot of times they weren't getting hired. Um, and I think that is critical. I don't pretend to know all of the ins and outs of why that is. Um, I know for myself, I put myself in the position of a hiring panel, um, as many of us have, have hired you know, lots of after school staff. I probably, well, I know I had biases. I don't know exactly what they were and I didn't necessarily examine them at the time, but um, if I could take some time with folks who are, if we all could take some time together as folks who are hiring after school staff and be able to reflect on what our biases are and include this age aspect of diversity in that, we might find that we have an ideal staff member in mind. And this folk, this person in front of me isn't, isn't looking like that person. And and you're right, if we, if we were to put that into, the, into most categories of diversity, we would instantly reflect on that and say, whoa, I gotta manage my biases and, and check that and, and, and be more open and inclusive and see what I need to do to change my hiring panel so that you know, we can minimize those biases. But many of us don't think about age in that way or haven't previously. And so I think that, that answer of, to the question of why are people not being hired um, is really a critical one to delve into. Um, I do think that if we if we really focus on the benefits and features of the after school job, I think there's a lot there that can be really appealing um, to the older adult workforce. You know, a lot of folks get to a point in their career where they want to do something more meaningful. A lot of folks get to a point in their career and their just work lives where they want to have more flexibility. They want to work less, but still be working. A lot of folks are in retirement and find that they want to do something with their time that feels meaningful, that feels socially connected. And they also want or need to make a little extra money 
And after school offers all those things. We don't have to make it up. Like the meaning is there. The social connection is there. Um, a little bit of money is there. Um, the issue of our, what we pay in the field is hugely critical to anything when we're talking about the staffing shortage. So I don't want to ignore that, but we don't have time to really delve into that. Um, and so I think that there's a lot that we can do to, to meet people at those tipping points where they're looking for something different and we have that to offer. And maybe we can collectively mount some campaigns, um, some staff recruitment campaigns that, that get at that, you know, and you look at the images of who are the staff in, in the ads, you know, if we have billboards or if we have online ads, like there's all kinds of things that go into that um, and folks that who have expertise in this area that we can lean on and bring in. Um, and my last sort of couple of points is I just want to say that I think it's really critical that we are careful about our language and that we define our terms. Um, when we ran the AARP Experience Core Partnership at LA's Best, at the very beginning, I was surprised to learn that um, volunteers qualified for that or were eligible for that if they were uh, 50 plus. Um, being 51 now, um, I will say that I'm happy to be eligible for anything, but I don't necessarily want to be referred to as an older adult or an elder or a senior, because like I'm just wrapping my head around the fact that I turned 50 and I'm already 51. So like we, we have to be careful about how we talk about this so as to not turn some people off. Um, and related to that, I would say also is, so as to not be condescending or patronizing. Um, I would, we didn't talk about this much, people didn't use this term much, but I had it in my notes before the webinar started. I would like to really question the use of this term wisdom worker with all due respect to whoever's bringing that. I'm sure there's, there's a lot of um, good intent behind it, um, but I think it can rub some people the wrong way for one thing, um, because it's a little cute. Um, and also because I think it sets up it kind of creates a setup there for both sides, the young staff, the young adult staff and the older adult staff who are coming in. Like there's some sort of expectation that I'm bringing something and if I don't bring it, then why am I called that? You know, and it's really like what we're here to be is colleagues. Like what we're here to be is like, like Eunice said, we're here to co-generate, right? We're here to work together. Not for me to, because I'm this age, I'm bringing a certain set of competencies. Um, and because you're that age, you're not, or you're bringing a different set of competencies. I know older folks who are really technologically capable. Um, a lot of the volunteers that we had with the Experience Corps partnership were retired teachers. So they brought a wealth of expertise, more than any of us had for working with children and, and knowing like quote kids these days, because they had recently retired. So I don't think we can make assumptions or we shouldn't make assumptions or lump people together too much. And I think terms like that, as well intended as they are, can have that unintended effect. Um, yeah, I think that's about it for me. I, I hope I'm not splashing cold water. Um, I certainly don't mean to be, but I, I do think that things that are look really great at a relatively small scale, when they're impossible at a large scale, don't help us move the needle at the level of like society or at the level of systems. Thank you, Eric. I think you just splashed some great opportunity for conversation. So thank you for that. Um, we have plenty of time for the panelists to discuss now, and then we'll have time for Q&A from attendees. So if you do have questions in the audience, please put them in the chat and Jess will moderate that in a, in a short bit. Um, but I'm just going to open it up. So Eric raised some questions. How do we get people to actually hire older, older, older adults and maybe check their biases around it? Um, what about the terms we're using and how do they sort of respect and like bring everyone in together? Um, yeah. And there's lots shared. So I'm opening it up to everybody. I would just like to start off the saying, oh, sorry, Eunice. You go first, Ian. Okay. Um, one of the things that's important is knowing the community that you're working in. You need to know the culture. You need to know the people that you're working with because in different communities, certain terms are accepted and certain terms are not accepted. So I think the most important thing is when you're recruiting older adults, um, making sure that you know where you're recruiting them from and understand what the, the, their cultures are and 
uh, they will tell you, and it's, it's like finding that I always call the gatekeeper in communities, that person that is that go-to person that, that knows everybody, knows every organization, they know who volunteers, um, talking to that person about, you know, what terminology, what works, um, because there's a lot of things that can be said in, in say, an African-American community, community that might not, you could say, in the Latino community or vice versa or any other any of the other communities. So just being mindful of knowing you're the community that you're working in. Thank you, Dan. Um, I wanted to jump in as well, because Eric, you gave us some really juicy things to talk about. So uh, I was like chomping at the bit halfway through what you said, and then you just kept throwing out even better things. So um, number one, I could not agree more that um, intergenerational volunteerism is uh, like a, it's a Venn diagram connected to, but very different than hiring older adults into a multi-generational team. Um, and often, like too often, uh, program staff are not thinking about how to age diversify their teams, even when they're running a program that is recruiting senior volunteers. And only when they really dig into the values of what's being created there, much like if you had, if you were serving a community of color that was not yours, you would turn around and be like, oh, how might I need to now relook at the diversity of my team to better serve? Um, I feel like every time we work with an organization that's running a program to age integrate their service out there, Inevitably, at some point, they start to turn the mirror back to look at themselves and end up actually running two initiatives. One is how to age integrate their programming, their service. And the other is how do they look organizationally at how they need to hire differently, train differently, support differently so their own teams can function in a healthy way. Um, I often think that while there might not be funding for the intergenerational service work, it is really expensive. Um, if we could just, as Michael suggested, look differently and hold targets for ourselves on how to actually hire age diverse teams, along with all the other forms of diversity, that feels like uh, a healthy place for all to start. And I'm really curious about who kind of holds the, the vision for inspiring or maybe even incentivizing after school programs to hit those targets on age diversity, the same way I think everybody has in their mind, other forms of diversity. Um, with our AmeriCorps, Age Integrating AmeriCorps Initiative, Generation Serving Together, um, we, we set targets where we said, how might you actually aim for like a 50-50 older and younger, um, you know, in, in a year-long AmeriCorps stipended role together? But it required casting a pretty bold and extreme vision for people to say, why might we do that? How would we do it? And then you look, all the systems that need to change. Um, and I think the most important thing, if you start to recruit and bring in older adults, if they're not there, um, people need to see themselves in the images and the stories that you tell of staff. Um, I think when we were uh, recruiting people back in the day, Michael and I trying to bring in more older people, um, older people and men were the, were the two targets that were hard to get. We were always looking for ways to show pictures of, tell stories of older men, older African-American men in particular in these communities, so that when they would see that, they'd say, oh, they want me. It's not some general person. They're actually looking for me. Um, so I'll just put that out there. I think the staffing piece is really important. The second one is um, on, the, on the naming of what we're called. Um, I also now am just two years shy of, shy of 50. Um, since my 20s, I've been longing to get to 50 because I saw so many people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond who are doing um, some of the most meaningful work of their life. And I find as I get closer, I don't have the angst that many of my peers have because I've always been surrounded by badass older folks. Um, but I find that ageism is so embedded, even in the way the closer I get, the more I'm like, oh, but I'm not old yet. And I'd like to think of myself as still young. Um, it's the young people who regularly have to tell me that I'm not young anymore. Um, and I think they see me as an older person as an elder, even though I don't see myself that way. So I don't debate the need to, to find words that resonate with the person you're talking about. In this case, let's say the new 50, 50 year olds. Um, but I would also say that, uh, that, that the perniciousness of ageism is present everywhere. And then that influences how we, the titles we are willing to take on ourselves or not, um, as well as in the hiring 
process. I feel like I know for sure, Michael, the reason we had a hard time getting older adults hired in, despite the fact there were those in the pipeline, was definitely ageism. And it's the stereotypes that we've many we've covered. Older adults don't have the energy. Well, I don't know, Eric, you're you're in your 50s. I'm getting close. Michael, you've said you could take a class of 20 year olds any day. Um, that older adults can't learn technology. Janice, you talked about um, in, in Deanne, uh, I think COVID showed us older adults are willing to get onto technology. Frankly, the Bill Gates of the world are older. They know more about technology than most young people. So that there's that. I think another big stereotype was that um, young people can't confidently supervise, support, or lead somebody twice their age. I had concerns about that when I ran a program where I was going to be supervising some staff that were older than me. I still do that today. I have some trepidation about that, but the reality is it can be done. Um, but there need to be a lot of really good, robust communication and probably a flattening of what it means to lead, uh, as well as a real humility to have two-way learning all the time as part of the values of your organization. Um, so and I feel like we just have to go after each of these stereotypes um, on both sides and start to dig away at them. I, I personally think, um, you know, as I was as I was listening to everybody speak, and I just kept thinking, what does my day to day world look like when we're when we're managing all of these different personalities? And it doesn't matter what age they are; it's different personalities, different skill sets. Um, when you're looking at hiring in the after school space, or in schools, or in education of any kind, or, or um, expanded learning, I think we have to look at what the programs look like. What, what is the program I'm hiring for? And is it designed for more structure? Is it designed for organized chaos where the kids are just running around and that's exactly what we want them to be having that experience? So when we're looking to hire, what are the personality traits and what is the background and what is the threshold of anybody? Um, regardless if they're 21 or they're 85, so when they're going to hire for this position or these this new program that they're going to be implementing, does it lend itself to a room that has more organization, more quiet, more structure? Um, or is it in the gym? Or is it, you, you know, um, a homework room? Or what does it look like? So we can better articulate that when we're in the hiring process. And what does it look like with training? If you're asking your program director to train for this position or this programming, have them, do they really understand what's needed? It's not just a warm body to fill that two to five o'clock slot. So I think it's really looking at doing some upfront work before you put out that job description and before you start filling the places for that particular program in the after school settings. So I want to just add one of the things that we found when we first started our program on the for recruiting volunteers, um, trying to recruit, like you said, males. So um, after the, the first year we looked at, I said, well, why don't we have a focus group of males? And we had um, some of them were not 50s or 50, but we brought them to the table, showed them the materials that we were using, the flyers, and, and talked about the program. And the first thing they said, the color of the flyer. You know, so we, we thought it was a nice color. It was, um, I think it was green and white or whatever, something basic. And they were saying that men do look at colors and something that pops at them. So they came up with using white, red, and black. You know, like, oh, okay, that sounds nice. And one of the other things that just got, you know, we're so busy trying to get the program up and running and getting volunteers. Um, the pictures on the flyer, there was not one male. Even though it says that we're recruiting, um, you know, males and females for a um, volunteer program, so on and so forth. There was not a male picture that just kind of like went over our head. So, you know, you learn a lot from the people that you're trying to recruit. So, you know, we 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 ended up putting pictures and 
um, making sure we had people of diverse backgrounds on the flyer. So we've come a long way. And one of the things that we have some um, uh, recruitment things going on now on Facebook, and one of the, the biggest hits that we're getting is one of the um, postcards has volunteers, but has the kids. Um, because people want to know who they're working with. So when they see these smiling faces or kids with no teeth in their front mouth, but just smiling, um, that's where the passion comes in. So uh, and really, I'm just talking about on the volunteer side, but it could be something that could be done. I think in all organizations, when you're looking at doing community work, is that really involve your community in helping you make that decision to design that program and how it should look, because those are the same folks that you're trying to get to fill those um, positions. So focus groups has always worked, always works to me. Spent several, several thoughts to chime in here. We're just reflecting on uh, Eric, your comments and the, and the subsequent conversation. I think what I'm processing is as much as we've talked about age diversity and being intentional about looking at that in our hiring practices and such. Um, I'm realizing my own reaction as a now a 63 year old person. I remember a couple months ago being in a group of a large group of people in a compassionate systems uh, training and uh, I was I, I got a bloody nose and I was walking out of the room to take care of my bloody nose when this young person said this elementary school's look that old man's got a bloody nose <laughs> holy crap that's me uh, well, none of us like that right none of, none of us see ourselves in that way at least I don't um but I also think maybe, and I'm thinking about the wisdom thing, Eric. Uh, it's it's certainly worth some some processing and and some some reflection. But I think we've used experience core so regularly that the magic of that word might be lost on on us, and how that might appeal in our advertising because that. Experience core was called experience core because that's what resonated. Like we need your experience. And I remember Eunice, one of the things that uh, was effective for us in our early advertising was like, we want to hire you because you're old. No, we want to hire you because you've got something to pass on. And I remember even as simple as like the message. Um, I, don't, I don't know, Eunice, if you put it on flyers or it was part of your conversation, but one of the questions was, do you have a hobby that you'd love to pass on to the next generation? And like Virginia, you mentioned Virginia. What didn't she used to like knit? That was her thing. She knitting would. And mm -hmm. knit, yeah, knitting and quilting. And so just, yeah. you know, that I'm thinking of that like, um, those messages and that's and and, those, and I also want to, one of the things I wrote down to share is that you beat me to it, Eric. Is that, um, but I, I'll I'll say this as the director of the expanded learning division. You don't have to hire staff to be there five days a week. You can be flexible and you can accommodate people's schedule and and consider that. Um, I want to add just one little story, Michael, on the experience name. Uh, now that I, I work at the mothership um, that include that invented Experience Core, uh, I heard a story from Mark where when we tested that name, we went in thinking Experience Core because these people are experienced. Um, the focus group revealed that older adults interpreted differently. They thought, um, I want to do this because I want an experience. They thought they were going to come and get <laughs> an experience. Um, which was really anchored in the desire to continue to learn and grow and do new and interesting things. Um, so I think it's so interesting to think about how do we in each 
generation let people decide how they want to be seen and what terms are used to engage them. Um, and I don't know, there are some people that are trying to reclaim wisdom or uh, reclaim elder eldership, modern eldership instead of the, the old ways of thinking. Uh, I think Deanna is exactly right. We have to look at context and community and see what's gonna resonate and it won't be one word for everyone. Um, so we'll see, we'll see. Um, I want to add one note, you know, I didn't talk much about what the Beacon Initiative does. Oh, look at your cat, Eric. Hello. Welcome to the panel. <laughs> um, so there are 27 Beacon community schools in San Francisco. So we get to hear from, you know, 13 different agencies hiring for after school and like integrated supports in the school day. Um, and one thing we've noted, especially since the pandemic is a lot of folks, say new hires, and we're talking about young people, like college, recent college graduates or younger, are very green. I mean, basically everyone is saying they're greener than they've ever been. And I think a lot of folks are really struggling to train and onboard a workforce that seems to need every detail about how to show up at work. And I think what you said at the very beginning, Eunice, about this benefit of older workers coming in with to be able to model professionalism is huge and we sort of have to we've got to convince our program directors who are doing hiring that this will again be another win-win right you're adding workforce and you're able to like not do all the mentoring yourself as the as the supervisor i think that's huge yeah i think i saw a question in the chat box about training and ongoing support for age integrating your team um, I thought I might say a word about that in that University of Chicago research that I referenced in the beginning where, you know, almost everybody said they think it's a good idea to bring multi-generational teams together. Young people want it more than any other generation. Um, there was another question we asked, which is, okay, if it's such a great idea, why isn't it happening? What are the barriers or challenges <clears throat> preventing you from doing this? Um, two things came up repeatedly. One was literally lack of opportunity. <clears throat> like when I when I think that I want to do something intergenerationally, I look around and there just aren't options there. I think that's a call to action for organizations to think about how they can provide the on-ramps and the pathways um, to, to, to bring the siloed structures of generations back together. Um, the second one was that now when I am in a multi-generational team, uh, people felt nervous or ill-equipped to communicate across perceived generation gaps on many levels, that there was nervousness around how to do that. For a young person that could be part of the like, oh, I'm now in this space that isn't just my peers. How might I navigate that? Um, but frankly, there are as many older adults who are nervous about how to talk to young people as colleagues as well. And so I think on the training side, um, proximity is good, but then you have to prepare people to be together. We think a lot about ways in which, uh, I think I heard somebody recently say, when you build a bridge, you have to build it from each end. You don't start in the middle. Um, how can we be thoughtful about what's the training that you do just with young people, helping to prepare them for working with older people and conversations you can kind of only have in a safe um, peer, you know, age peer group only. What's the conversations you have with, with your older staff workers um, about what it's gonna be like to work with young people and after equipping them with, um, with some sense of who they are and what they're walking into, then bring them together. Um, I think the communication piece is really important. Um, older adults may be looking for more communication from emails or from the phone and young people may not respond to them. And then there can be a sense of like, oh, they're not paying attention or they're not professional when actually we need to learn different ways of communicating, whether it's text. If you use Slack in your, I don't know if any after school programs are using that. That's a big contentious thing for us in our, in our work is what's the communication tool? Um, just being able to talk about it and say, what do different people need? How do you feel respected or not respected is opening up a portal to better, to better teamwork. Um, I'll say one more thing. Sometimes even the, the built or physical environment, um, often I would be in an after school space um, with the kids in a tutoring session, especially in elementary school, they'd only be those like little chairs. Um, our older adult said, I cannot sit in that chair. Like it, the space was literally not physically designed for them. There was one adult chair, the teacher's chair, right? 
Um, the minute we brought that in, um, most things that are good for one um, population for the older adults was actually better. I didn't want to sit in that little chair. I had just never thought to ask for it. Um, and so the ways in which we bring flexibility, older people are not the only ones who might appreciate more flexibility in after school jobs. Um, there are younger people, um, somebody, maybe somebody in their middle stage of life who has kids, but would like to do something after school or might like to be in a summer program, but can't commit all year. Um, there might be somebody who is a young person who is an artist, um, can't make enough there and needs a flexible job, maybe project oriented after school. Uh, work would be more useful for some folks. So um, while it would absolutely be useful for older adults as we design for that, I think it will actually be beneficial to other categories of people that are currently not engaged in after school that might be able to get involved. I wanted to speak to what Eric said. Um, Eric, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. Um, no, I'm sorry. I, I have to just interrupt because I have to leave a few minutes early. I'm on, I'm on the East Coast. I'm in, I'm in Rhode Island, um, very snowy Rhode Island. I have to go get my son at school. So sorry, Janice. Um, no worries. Go ahead, finish up. I just wanted to say thank you so much for the conversation. I'm available to continue it, and I really appreciate um, Sam and 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 Sally and um, everyone who brought this together. Jess, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Take care. Um, you. I'm from the East Coast, so I I just sent my daughter back to Connecticut. So I I appreciate what he's dealing with right now with the snow. Um, what I wanted to to, to also mention was something that Eric. Um, being in LA's best program that was part of a larger beast, which is the LA Unified School District. All the things that we're saying in general, if we're a small standalone program, there's more control over the, the, the design of how we incorporate staff. If, if, if you're listening right now and you're with a bigger organization and you don't necessarily have the decision-making power to alter how a program is staffed or funded or or organized um it can be frustrating because in theory you really see this perfect model of having this this co-generational staff yet there isn't an option they all have to be employed at the same rate they all have to work 20 hours they all need to be there from two to six they whatever it is may not lend itself to that flexibility so if you drill down further and say, okay, I don't have that flexibility, but I can build the culture within who I have to hire and I need to learn more. I don't know enough about co-generational employment. I don't know enough about how to train. Um, so find those people. You've got a fantastic panel right here of, of um, people who embrace co-generational training and bring the, 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 all the different aspects of, um, of generativity to it. So it may feel like a bigger beast to, to, to manage, but if you, if you realize that this is something you really want, then I would, I encourage everybody to go out and look at this opportunity. My best meetings are when I have my whole team, my staff, my volunteers, um, my vistas, and I'm seeing just this connection of conversation and mutual respect amongst each other, but it didn't happen overnight. I would have some of my older adult volunteers calling me frustrated because the only way they were being communicated with was through an email. They retired because they didn't want to read emails, but all they needed to realize was when you have this many people that you were communicating with, the best way for me to reach you is through a quick email. Can you check it at least once a day? And gave them a reason behind how important it was to be communicated by an email versus me picking up the phone and getting it into a two hour conversation because they just wanted to chat. So communication, clear expectations and a great roadmap to your end game, I think is probably the best takeaway I can give right now in having a successful program work with multi-generations all connected. I'm gonna add one more, Janice, you triggered a thought for me of another stereotype that I think is healthy or helpful to break down. Um, I think some organizations are worried about hiring an older adult where they look at the resume and like, oh, that person's overqualified for the job. 
Um, and in particular in after school programs where turnover is already high, I, I can imagine the hiring mentality of you really want to get the right fit so the person will stay. Um, for a number of older adults, the thing that you think they want is not the thing they want. I know many older adults who have had a career, they've built up the, the resume. The thing they really want is direct um, connection with youth. They're not looking for the administrative job. They're not looking for the coordinator job. Um, that's not true for all older adults, but for many, they're actually looking for that, that return to, uh, to direct relationship. And that means that if you have a multi-generational team, sometimes what happens organically is there isn't like a, a, a fighting for going up the ladder. You have a, a, a stable group of older folks who want to be working directly with kids and it allows young people to step up into some of the administrative work as they're trying to build their own career ladder. Um, and and it, it can work really beautifully. And I think I've seen a lot of stability in teams happen because of that. I'm gonna pass it to Jess with a question from a attendee. Yeah, um, first, this has been such a wonderful conversation and so many amazing program models. Um, we have a question here that's a little more logistical and also maybe I'll frame it by saying, there's been some really interesting sort of research from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that the 55 plus demographic is the biggest growing portion of the workforce. Um, it'll be like a full quarter, I think in the next five years or so. So just in terms of sheer numbers, whether it's a volunteer uh, type program or hiring sort of into a full-time position, that's a huge group of people that's out there um, that can be sort of tapped into. But that gets to this question from Caleb in, in Cleveland. I don't know if it's snowing there, but um, Caleb says, we use a mix of paid and volunteer tutors in our after-school program. And we noticed that naturally older the older workers are going towards the volunteer positions, but not the paid positions. And so they're asking, how do you recommend getting our positions in front of the older workers? Are there organizations to connect with, different strategies? Um, I really think our disconnect is reaching these populations in the first place. So does anybody have any thoughts on that? Have you asked a volunteer if they wanna work for you? If you don't ask, they can't say yes. Don't assume they wanna volunteer. And I'll still conjure Eric since he's not here, but the, um, have you built in flexibility? Are there, are there some levers on flexibility? Once again, asking is the reason you're doing volunteer versus paid because of a, an assumption or a sense of more flexibility? Are there ways to build that into the job? Um, I've often thought just as, as a starting point that there's actually some nice flexibility specifically in the nature of after school programs that many older adults would, that would appeal to them even more than younger people. Something that's anchored in half a day, not the full day. Something where there, you might get the summers off naturally um, for folks who have uh, especially retired but still need to make a little something. Not everybody wants to return to the full-time, full-time. Um, so that playing with the flexibility lever, I think is really important. One of the things that we find too, that some of our volunteers uh, want to volunteer, but they don't even accept the stipend because of <clears throat> their retirement income and their social security, it puts them over a limit. So if you're working, it's one thing, but if you have retired, you know, you have limits onto your income. So we always tell people to check with their tax folks to make sure. So if that's the case, I have some volunteers, they might take a stipend um, five months out, out of the year, then the other six, seven, other four, they might um, say, don't, you know, don't pay me for those four months. So there's ways of just having to have a conversation with folks and letting them know there are options um, because sometimes just a little bit of something kind of helps folks, but each individual case is really different when it comes to how much they can receive um, monthly because that really adds to their income. And maybe they don't have space to add extra dollars because that's more tax dollars that they have to pay. It puts them in another tax bracket. So you have to be mindful of that. Um, Jess, I'm going to add one more thought. I don't know if this is true, but um. Michael, you might be able to speak to this. I wonder if for some older adults that are volunteering and, and if you did present them with the job description, if there also might be like, wow, in my volunteer role, I'm, it's like one-on-one, -on -one. I'm stepping into the paid job 
may actually be something that feels a little, even though they have the skills, um, doing that and, and holding that might feel actually intimidating. And something we've been digging into a lot more at CoGenerate is um, are our models of leading and holding a space where it's a single person, even the best model, um, are there ways to re-envision some after-school roles as co-generationally led? If you invited somebody into a job description where they weren't doing it alone, um, where they were doing it, let's say, paired up with a young person to lead an after-school class or to um, launch a new program together, might there be a, a quicker yes or some an added interest in taking something like that on? Yeah, Eunice, and I would say that would have been more difficult three years ago when <clears throat> the after school education safety or 21st century were that was the funding the state funding in california and required a 20 to 1 ratio and so the staff you're recruiting are, are actually people to meet that 20 to 1 ratio and there wasn't really enough money to hire a lot of staff outside of the ratio staff that's changed with the expanded learning opportunities program with every district having an apportionment, districts can do exactly what you're saying. Um, they have the resources if they choose to invest the money in that way. So there's lots of competition for the dollars when the dollars get that high, but it is the dollars are there now to be able to do that. Or, or you know, parentis benefits from the ELOP program through through indirect reasons. So the, the school district provides the ELOP monies to the Boys and Girls Clubs. The Boys and Girls Clubs knows they do not have the staff or the capacity now to handle. They need to bring in more at-risk youth into their clubs, which means there's more burden on the existing staff. So one of the things they've recognized is, is hiring in a program partner to help offset like our like the experience core program where i have 15 or 20 volunteers they don't need to know how to manage the volunteers we do but now we can service 60 to 80 kids exponentially more than that one or two staff people who have one to 20 are able to do on a one-to-one -one basis so the partnership is becoming more powerful thanks to the elop money if that's exactly like you said michael is that if that's how they choose to to invest the monies that they're coming into the schools and after school programs um, for ELOP. But so it's it's almost taking the volunteer population as long as there's somebody who knows how to manage and train and oversee that population. And it's not necessarily the staff of the after school programs because they've never been trained on it. So it's one thing to say we want to diversify our age group of employees, but it's another to say, do we have the capacity and the knowledge to take on that 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 role? And that's what Eric was talking about with LA's Best. They just didn't have, you know, they, they dedicated a half of a time person to a program that takes an enormous amount of time to nurture. So it's something that you have to think about through the programming and the after-school programs. Um, we are at 1159 folks. This has been such an interesting conversation at some point. Um, Eunice said, we want to light a fire to build intentional co-generational teams. And I know a fire has been lit for me. And I think a lot of the panelists, um, and the attendees for folks who are in attendance, we're going to share the recording of the webinar afterwards, um, and look for a, how Kids Learn Foundation Temescal Associates paper on this very topic. So thank the thank you all panelists so much for your time. This is so helpful. The conversation was so interesting. And I'm hoping we get to meet up again in a couple of years and look at how this is scaling and um, integrating more and more. So thank you for the invite. Yes. Thank Pleasure you. Pleasure to all of you. Thank you. Nice meeting everybody. Thank you. Good luck out there, everybody. Right. <laughs> Good luck out there. Have a great <laughs> your day, everyone. All right. I'm gonna.